Hello and welcome to the second episode of Euros Weekly. I'm UCFB graduate Jack Richardson, joined by some great guests today. First of all, starting off with graduate Wes McGrath. How are you doing today? Yeah, all good, Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, also going to be joined by Morgan and Callum from Archibald UK. You all right, boys? Yeah, yeah you're right, mate. And finally, soon to be graduate Beth Powney. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you, Jack. That's all good. I mean, you know, we say we're all doing well, but I think we've got to address the elephant in the room, as you can see by the shirts. We are, of course, all England. And um, yeah, it wasn't too good on Friday against Scotland. I want to get all of your thoughts on the game. I think I'll start with you, Wes. Uh, sort of just your overall thoughts and feelings following that performance. Um, well, I think going into the game, um, I was fairly confident, um, thinking probably England were going to win about 2-0. But I think it was important for England to manage that first hour of the game. Um, you know, I did have a feeling it would be a bit scrappy and, and things like that. And obviously the game sort of turned out that way. But um, yeah, I think sort of after that hour point, the game sort of went into a bit of a lull. Um, obviously, Gareth Southgate made a few changes, um, but it didn't really have the... The desired effect and I think England missed a kind of number 10 operating in between the lines of, of the Scotland midfield and, and defence um, you know someone to try and get on the half turn and and try and link play really from midfield to to attack um, but yeah no it was, it was really disappointing I think and everybody's a bit like downhearted now off the back of a really sort of positive first performance against Croatia where everybody was you know, pretty to a man, everybody was pretty much immense. Um, and we go from that, like I say, to then a, a real, you know, disheartening and underwhelming performance against against Scotland. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I think, as you mentioned, especially after that Croatia game where, you know, the morale was pretty high, it was definitely a bit disheartening, that Scotland performance. Beth, you in agreement there? Or are you anything yeah. positive to take from it? Or? I was, didn't really want to wear the shirt today, if I'm honest. That makes two of us. It was, you know, it's just so disheartening. It's typical England though, isn't it? Let's be honest. Like every time England start playing in a major tournament, we're all like, yes, it's coming home. And then, you know, it is just in England fashion to sort of let us down. And especially against Scotland as well. And the, the pool of talent that we have, I just don't think that they're being utilised enough. Like Jude Bellingham, for example, I think that would probably be a perfect game to like, you know, Gareth Southgate loves bringing up the youngsters and thank God Jordan Pickford was on the ball that game because he made like some pretty critical saves and, and demanded his box well. But I just, you know, it's just disheartening, really. I think it's a, it's an interesting one because I think we, we kind of look at Scotland and obviously in their first game set up with their, that back three or that back five, if you like. Um, so I think we maybe... Maybe you'd have swapped Rashford in for or Sancho in for Foden, perhaps, or you know, do you sacrifice Phillips or Rice and again put um, move Foden in a bit more centrally, um, and then you know, have a bit more pace in the wider areas? Um, but no, I just think you know, I, th I think it was more in game that I think is where the, the real frustration is. You know, you can see that you're dominating the game. Um, and we, you know, we're starting to take the game to Scotland and it's like, well, they're not really posing too much of a threat attacking wise. Um, and really, I know it looked like, but you know, they were getting some half chances or some little, little spells. But I think by and large, our centre-halves would have, would have really sort of covered that. Um, so I think it was more in-game, like, you know, 70 odd minutes in the game, not really attacking much and creating much. And you've still got two more holders in Rice and Phillips that wanted to play in the same spaces. It's like, you know, we saw in that Croatia game, Phillips playing a lot higher. It was really refreshing. Obviously, when he's at Leeds, he's playing a lot deeper, pretty much in the same area as Declan Rice. But, yeah, I think in-game to see Rice and Phillips almost playing on each other's toes 70-odd minutes into the game, you're there like, well, bring on, for example, you know, Beth said they're a, a Bellingham or, or somebody of that ilk, um, you know, or whether it's, you know, somebody just to maybe take the game um, you know, and carry the ball towards Scotland. Obviously, yes, Grealish done it a few times, but you know, when Gareth made those substitutions, it was very like for like, really, apart from Kane going off. Um, but even then, he's, he's taken off a, a major goal threat, really. Um, obviously, Harry Kane's won the Golden Boot in the Premier League. Um, you know, I'm a Spurs fan, so I'd always want Harry Kane to be on the pitch um, as well. But yeah, it was just, I think it was more in game as opposed to, you know, that starting 11. Because I think, you know, as the boys said there, you know, it was pretty hard to to drop anybody really from that from that Croatia game because everybody was superb. Using those younger players, I think then that will then stop the predictability. They won't, it won't be as predictable. 
I think they have seen like like when Calvin Phillips was playing, he just seemed way more creative than our older players that we've got, and it, they, we just seemed to be like he wanted it more. So I think utilizing those younger players, I definitely think, would make an impact. Yeah, I think that's definitely an interesting point. Actually, um, you know, using those younger players, they're, sometimes they're a bit more hungry, and I think you saw that with Calvin Phillips getting that start in the first game against Croatia. Uh, to you, Callum and Morgan, what do you think in terms of that? Do you think uh, the young player should be used or are you of the opinion that experience is what's needed? I feel like, especially in games like Croatia, not Croatia, like Scotland, where we weren't doing much, we weren't breaking down the team, it was very obvious what we were doing, just back and forth, sideways football. Bringing on someone like Bellingham to fill in that void where Callum Phillips was, he's obviously sitting a lot deeper, he can, uh, he's got the legs to get up and down the field and Bringing in somebody 17 years old, no one's really going to know how he's going to affect the game, especially for, from Scotland's point of view. So bringing him on, it would definitely bring something new to the team. I think there's, there's no harm in doing it, especially at the top point when we were just drawing. That There's no harm in bringing him on. I think we really needed some game changers, and we have these young, exciting players. So we had Foden and Mount on the field, but then Grealish and Sancho on the bench. These young, exciting players who are hungry to come and change the game. And I think that's what we were crying out for against Scotland. Yeah, you mentioned um, players that he sort of trusts, that he knows, that he likes to use. And I'm going to go to you, Wes, here, as sort of the resident Spurs fan. And, you know, this might ruffle a little bit, you know, it might ruffle a few feathers. But I think for two games now, Harry Kane has been a little disappointing. Um, I think, A, would you agree with that? And B, do you think he is droppable? Um, listen, listen, yeah. England, in, English media, yeah. yeah. But we need to come outside and have a chat because, do you know what I mean? I was watching the Spain-Poland game, right, on BBC, and all of a sudden Lewandowski's not in the game. Oh, it's due to a lack of service, right? Harry Kane's not in the, Oh, he's this, he's, he's got to be doing... And it's like, hold on a minute. I need the same energy, yeah, from for Lewandowski and for Harry Kane. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, Benzema's had an underwhelming tournament. There's nothing regarding Benzema. Um, but no, because it's Harry Kane, because he plays for Tottenham and there is a media bias and a media agenda against Tottenham. I don't care what anyone says. Anybody can at me if they want. Right? There is this bias and agenda against Tottenham. All right. Um, but look, I think Kane hasn't had nowhere near the level of service that he he requires in games. Like we see it. I think his role for England is completely different to his role for Tottenham, by the way. Um, like at Tottenham, things go through him. Um, whereas with England, we've got, you know, as the boys mentioned, we've got other like almost game changers. We've got Grealish, Foden, um, you know, Sancho, Rashford, you know, all these guys that would perhaps take that responsibility upon themselves. Whereas with Kane at Tottenham, like he's that guy that does it. Um, and like I said, I think, you know, for in that Scotland game, there was nobody trying to connect the play um, in order to try and like help Harry Kane out. It's like, well, if Kane's not getting involved in the game, he needs to come and drop deep. But then if he drops deep, he's not perhaps in the positions that we need him to be, which is in the penalty area. And then when he's in the, when he's doing that, it's like, well, Kane, you need to get in the penalty box. Do you know what I mean? So, um, look, I think, I think Kane is, well, we've seen that Kane is potentially droppable in the sense that, you know, he's been taken off a couple in both games. Um, but I just think he needs, he needs the service. Like he's not getting anywhere near, the level of service that that he requires for him to then show his qualities that that we all know he has on the ball. But I mean, you know, if you if you are in a tight game and you do get half a chance, I think there's probably one person in the England squad that you would want the ball to fall to in and around the penalty area, and it is Harry Kane. But it's it's strange sometimes, like when I watch and when I watch him for Spurs as well. Sometimes it's like you know, at times he might come off or whatever, and it's like then we end up starting playing to like almost how Harry Kane would want us to play, but he's not on the pitch. Um, so I think, you know, at times, certainly when he went off, it was like, right, OK, Rashford came on and it was like, well, all of a sudden now we're playing a bit more to the strengths of Harry Kane, even though Harry Kane's not on the pitch. So it was really strange. Um, but look, I'll defend, I'll defend Captain Kane. Um, I still think he's going to come good. Um, so, yeah, stick with him um, and he will come good, 100%. Yeah, I, I did figure that might have been your answer. And uh, I would like to go on record and say I don't think Kane should be dropped. I just wanted to you know, create a bit of conversation. Uh, I will say from my point of view, I feel like at Tottenham, 
um, as you said, everything goes through him. And I feel like he did sort of get into that habit of dropping deep to create stuff because Tottenham might not have the same game changes that England have. And I think that might have hindered both him and England's performances. But uh, yeah, as I said, I don't think he should be dropped. But Beth, you seem to quite enjoy the, the suggestion that maybe he is droppable. Are you thinking that he is or should be? I just think it's funny to see Wes's reaction because you know what, he's, he's going to back him. Um, see, yeah, I don't know. I feel like sort of echo what Wes says, when we play towards Harry Kane's strengths and play um, through him, he definitely, like, we need to start utilising our strengths and we know Harry Kane is like a, a goal scorer. He can bang a goal and, you know, we need to start doing that more. I don't know, it's, I, I, who would we really replace Harry Kane and know that they'd definitely get the job done? The Sheffield R9, PCL. <laughs> Wes, I don't think you could be in the camp of two players. I think it's either Kane or Calvert Lewin. I think I know. Well, obviously, is, obviously I'd go suggestion. with Kane. I'd go with Kane, but if if we're talking about obviously potential players to come in and replace him, it's probably going to be Calvert Lewin, isn't it? Really? Um, yeah, the Sheffield R9. Um, so obviously, Don Carlos done, worked absolute wonders with him at Everton this season between him and Duncan Ferguson. But yeah, I mean, I'll always back Captain Kane um, as as a, as a Spurs fan. I'll always back my my guys. Um, so yeah, but I think yeah, obviously, if we are going to look to perhaps drop Kane, you would probably argue that Calvert Lewin is probably the most suitable um, candidate for the for the job. I think yeah, if we want not- more, sorry, I think if we want a bit more. Wes, don't bite my head off. If we want a bit more creativity, I think maybe Calvert Lewin. Um, but uh, <laughs> trending on eggshells, but yeah, yeah. Can I throw it out there that Harry Kane won the Playmaker Award, by the way? Um, so, you know, the most assists in the Premier League, and you want to drop him? <laughs> <laughs> never said I wanted to drop him, but never said I wanted to drop him. Just said if possibly more creativity. Well, this is, yeah, but this creativity is, is like setting, setting things up, Beth. Creativity setting things up. You want to drop the guy that's won the Playmaker Award. Make it make sense, please. please. Oh. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to have to mediate this a little bit and ho- head over to Morgan and Callum maybe to get the final word in on this sort of debate. Uh, your thoughts on Kane? Is he droppable? Is Calvert-Lewin a suitable replacement? What do you guys think? I feel in general for England, Kane isn't as good as he is for Spurs. But I feel like because his his work for Spurs is so incredible, you can't drop him for that sake alone. As uh, you said before, if, if there's one player you want the ball to drop to, you want it to be Kane. But I feel like for some reason, watching it for England, he does do what he does for Spurs, dropping in deep, and it kind of affects the rest of the team. And the fact that like, Mount is always in that half space in the middle of the pitch up pitch. And especially when Grealish comes on, he sort of floats in and around the left-hand side. So with Kane dropping in deep, it kind of affects that. If you want, I feel like if you want Kane to succeed, we need to force him to stay far up the pitch and be the target man. Because when Rashford came on, he was playing as a target man, which doesn't make much sense considering Kane would definitely be a better, much better target man than him. So. Um, no, I, I, I wouldn't say Kane is profitable. I think he is on the balance of it all our best player, he's a goal scorer, he's the man you want in the box and around the box to score your goals. And I, I agree with Morgan that he does have to play differently for England and Spurs. The spaces that he tries to occupy at Spurs to play at his best game are taken with England with the players like Mount, Bowden, and Grealish in those attacking spaces. So I think he needs to be sort of repurposed for England to have him further up the pitch and take some of the onus of creating away from him. Prove to him we've got the creative players and he has to be there to finish. Yeah, no, I think that's fair enough. As I say, putting it on the record, I don't think Kane should be dropped. But uh, sort of moving on from all the negativity surrounding England, going on to you, Beth, do you think midfield battles are the key to the game against the Czech Republic or do you think it will be elsewhere on the pitch? Um, I definitely think, yeah, midfield... Summit, summit needs to, summit needs to happen. I think you, we can't go back, we can't go into that game with the same lineup. Summit needs to be changed. Don't know what Southgate's thinking, um, but defensively as well, you know, I'd actually love to see Connor Cody. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> just for like, I don't know. I just love to. I just love to see him in a just playing. Not even for like a, a tactical or any for reason. But um, Mings, I do. I, I love. I love having Mings centre back, and I think he's solid. But he does. He scares me a bit sometimes. I think sometimes when he comes up behind a player, I think he's definitely going to concede a penalty or something. But um, yeah, I think uh, definitely we need to look more attacking. I think when we're finding our feet with the defence now, and I think we need to start working to that midfield and finding a sort of something that clicks and not just relying on teams that we've used before. We need to start, we need to do something different, whether that be bringing on the youngers or or something. Yeah, no, definitely. Attack has definitely been, been where the issue is. Um, I mean, you mentioned a change in defence with Connor Cody there. I know he's liked by a lot of people. Uh, obviously, we haven't conceded yet, so I think it's tough to argue yeah. against the defence. But uh, attacking-wise, definitely, I think there probably needs to be changes. Uh, to you, Morgan and Callum, going into this final group game against the Czech Republic, um, just sort of two questions. A, what do you think we'll see sort of tactically in terms of team selection, how we play? And B, what do you expect to see from the game? Do you think it's one that we should win or do you think it'll be a difficult battle against the Czech Republic? I feel like the Czech are going to sit back. They did that against Scotland. And obviously Scotland aren't as attackingly great as we probably are. So I feel like they're going to sit back against us. I feel like we need, if, if possible, we need to bring Maguire back in because his progressive passing is is, is unreal for us. For Man United at least, it's unreal. So it'd be helpful for us uh, progressing the ball at the pitch. I feel like tactically we should go into it all guns blazing really with not much to lose. I mean, there's a chance we could finish third, but I don't think that we will. I think we'll guarantee at least second at this point. I feel like we should play with someone like Bellingham in there o- o- over Calvin Phillips or Declan Rice, whichever one I want to sit. Just, it's just more legs in the field. And um, Bellingham is also defensively sound. He plays that role for um, Dortmund. He plays in that number six slash eight role. I feel like you've got to bring in, you've got Grealish has to start. He's arguably our second best player over before, um, before Kane. And then I, there's no reason why Sancho shouldn't play. I feel like just having tricky wingers, it, it'll be good. Especially against Sufau, he, he's been very good for West Ham this year. So having someone like Grealish or even Sancho to give him a good tough game would be, be very uh, impactful for us. I mean, I agree with a, a lot of what Morgan just said. I'd love to see us maybe abandon the 4 2 3 1 formation and go into more of a 4 3 3, bringing in Jude Bellingham because. I think he offers us a lot more than Calvin Phillips does. Whilst Calvin Phillips had some great, well, especially gracious, a great performance, I think we need someone who's going to progress us forward and gets playing as a team. I feel like there was a disconnect between our holding midfielders and our defence to, compared to the rest of the pitch. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to see us moving forward more as a team. Again, Grealish and Sancho, I'd love to see them come in. I don't, whether they will or not, it's a different question. As I said before, Gareth Southgate does love to trust uh, trust his players and really give them every opportunity. But I think maybe if we see Grealish and Sancho, we could be in be in for a good a good game. I think all in England fans are probably in agreement that we'd love to see more of Grealish and Sancho, especially who's not even got a minute yet. Um, we could talk about that all day, but I just think I want to you know press you for sort of a a prediction for the game on Tuesday night. So start sticking with you two boys first. Um, I predict it'll be a close score. I feel like it's going to be similar to both games, but it'll be like a one-goal margin. I, I reckon defensively we'll probably win one nil, one nil, two nil. Uh, two one to England or oh, two, yeah, two England. Uh, yeah. So, where's your prediction for Tuesday night's game? What are you thinking? Will it be um, a tight scoreline like that? Yeah, I'd probably say two nil. Um, I'm hoping Captain Kane gets a uh, gets a goal. Um, I think it it would kickstart not only his tournament, but I think it would pro- maybe kickstart the team's tournament as well. Um, obviously, you know the main man, um, you know scoring. I think it would just give everybody a lift. You know, it's uh, hearing the different players speak about Harry Kane and what he does in and around the the camp and things like that. I think that would give everybody that that lift. Um, so yeah, I think he's going to bag, and I reckon. Maybe a, a a creative player pick one of however many we've we've got because we've got loads. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say one of those um, might might score as well, or even probably Johnny Stones from a from a corner. Um, 
a little set piece. Um, so obviously England was strong at set pieces from from the last World Cup. So might be another avenue for us to get some get some goals in in this tournament as well. Because I think from what I've seen so far, most countries don't look sound um, from set pieces anyway. So like I say, it could be a, another potential avenue for us. So all positive so far. Beth, your prediction for Tuesday night? Are you carry on the trend? I or? think I think it will be tight. I think it'll be one one first half and I think we'll win two one. I think we're due to concede. Um and I think we probably will concede, but you know, I think that's what what it's gonna be like. I think if we take start taking our chances, look more hungry for it have a midfielder that gets the ball in midfielder and wants to go forward instead of playing the ball back. I think that would be a game changer and not be so predictable coming down the wings. And I think if we do that, then I think we'll definitely win. But I do think we will we'll concede. I mean, I think we're all in agreement that this will be a tough game. Um, but it's all positive. Everyone thinks we'll win. I, I, I said before the tournament that Czech Republic were my dark horses and I do think it will be our toughest game. But... I think the Scotland result will actually almost be a blessing in disguise. I think it will kick our players in the right direction and I think we can get the win on Tuesday night. Um, obviously, we could talk about England all day, but it is the Euros. There's a lot more teams involved in just England. Um, so we've seen everyone play at least twice now. So I just wanted to ask all you guys sort of before we finish is, uh, what team do you think has been the best and sort of look most likely to go all the way? And also, what player has impressed you the most? I know international tournaments can always open your eyes to players you might not have watched before. So, yeah, teams have impressed you the most and a player that's been the best. I'll, I'll start off with you guys, Morgan and Callum. Um, team impressed the most is probably Italy. No, I think they went under their radar a little bit, considering everyone would have thought like someone like France would win the Euros. But I thought Italy probably the, looking the strongest so far. A player that's kind of shocked me is Dumfries. I've watched both of the Holland games. And he's been incredible. He, he's got a, such a good engine on him, defensively sound, and he, he's incredible going forward as well. He, he's got two goals, and he's got an assist. Not an assist. He won a penalty for them as well. I think for me, um, I agree. Italy have been fantastic so far, and really look as if they could go all the way. I think Roberto Mancini's done a fantastic, a fantastic job with them. I think Belgium as well has been very good. And I think they've been driven by Kevin De Bruyne, who's been my player in the tournament so far. I think he's just been he's been excellent. I think he's just really shown why he gets so many plaudits. I think he's one of the best players in the world. Uh, you're not wrong. Kevin De Bruyne definitely is special. And when he came on at halftime against Denmark, I just think he showed what he's capable of completely changing the game. And Dumfries as well, a player that I didn't see much of. So that's a great shout because he has been excellent. Uh, Beth, a team and a player that's impressed you so far? Um, do you know, I can't actually think of a player that's impressed me. Um, I'm quite hard to please, but I really, <laughs> really enjoy... Watching France, France always excite me. Whatever tournament, I always like the, the talent that they've got. I just think they're so creative and they're just, you know, they're just so interesting to watch and the, their style of play of football. Um, I've really enjoyed watching France. So, Wes, we've had Italy, we've had France. Is it one of those two for you or someone else impressed you? Just Harry yeah. Kane. <laughs> any Tottenham player at the tournament um, well there's not there's not that many there's now compared many to the last tournament um, shows how bad we've been over the last couple of years but I think I'm going to probably go and carry the Italy train um, they've been absolutely superb um, you know the way Mancini's got them set up um, and now obviously the you, you hit, you're seeing a lot more stats about the record that he's got there I think Italy like I think like the boys said they've gone sort of under the radar um, and I think they're probably now Looking at it, they're probably kind of my team that I would back to sort of go all the way and, and at least hit sort of semis, if not get to the final. Um, a player that's impressed me, um, I, I'm going with Mbappe. Like, this guy is just on another level. Mm -hmm. For one, so young. Like, you know, I was watching the, the game against Hungary, the way he just absolutely burned past that Hungary player. Um, you know, he'd literally done it from a starting position. Um, and obviously, with his pace, you know, usually players either have pace or technical ability. It's very rare that you get the mix of both, but this guy's got both in abundance. And, you know, he's still only, what, 22? Absolutely frightening. Um, definite Ballon d'Or winner um, in, in the next few years, 100%. Um, so, yeah, Mbappe's been been the one that has stood out for me. I think it's, like, we all knew the quality was there, but it's we've seen it, you know, in P for PSG. We all know the league isn't necessarily the strongest league. 
We've seen flashes in the Champions League. Um, so it was all, I think this is kind of a, a pivotal tournament for him to kind of cement him himself in that, that world and that global stage. Um, and from what I've seen so far, he's well on the way to doing that. I think he sent a couple of the Germans back to, you know, wherever they wherever they come from in the first game. Obviously, it was a bit unfortunate. It got ruled out for offside. But like literally everybody was was on Twitter going like, look, just just let the goal happen. Like he's just done absolute madness in the box. Just let the goal happen kind of thing. So, yeah, Mbappe, Mbappe's been been my standout player so far. Yeah, like Beth said, France are just such an exciting team to watch. So full of talent, and Mbappe is the key to all of that. I feel like every time he gets gets the ball, or even near the ball, there's sort of this gasp, and you just expect something special to happen. He's so lightning quick that there was one there was one scenario I think up against Hummels, where I feel like Hummels must have had like a 10, 15 meter head start, and Mbappe still beat him to the ball. He, he really is incredible, but. Um, yeah, I think for me, France are probably still my favourites to go all the way. That squad, I mean, they could probably send two teams and both get to the final. I think that's just how much depth <laughs> they've got. But um, Italy, definitely the team to have impressed me the most. I think a lot of people had written them off, given that they weren't at the 2018 World Cup. I think people forgot quite how good they were, but they've been brilliant under Mancini. And look, three wins without conceding is all you can ask for from the group stage. It's perfect. And I think just to finish off, we've spoken about who's impressed us and stuff like that. Who's been disappointing for you and, you know, might even be England, but is there anyone who you've really been disappointed to watch this time round? I'll, 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 I'll start with you, Wes, stick with you. Whoa, what a question that is, by the way. Um, I, I wouldn't say they've disappointed me, but I think Spain's lack of cutting edge in the final third has been very alarming. Um, they've got some wonderful technicians across the pitch, um, and, you know, you spoke there about France's squad depth. They're happy to let Americ Laporte, who's arguably been one of the best defenders in the Premier League for the last couple of years, you know, they're happy to allow him to switch allegiance and go to Spain. Um, but, yeah, I think kind of Spain's cutting edge or, or lack of it almost in that final third has been really, really surprising because, of, like I said, they've got some wonderful technicians in there. Um, and, you know, they have struggled. I know they had a bit of an issue with COVID um, just before the start of the tournament. But, um, yeah, I think Spain, Portugal as well, could argue with some of the players that they've got. Um, haven't really set the world alight. Um, obviously, defending champions as well. Um, so I think they've been a little bit disappointing. But again, they're in that group of death. So it is a bit, you know, it's one. Of, there was probably one team um, that was going to perhaps underwhelm in that group. And I guess, unfortunately for Portugal, it's them. But I'd probably go with, with those two, um, certainly off the top of my head, that have sort of underwhelmed or disappointed me so far. Callum and Morgan, are you in agreement with that? Or is there someone else who you've watched and just gone, oh, this isn't what I was expecting? Yeah, Spain, it's a very scenario where they can do everything great until the final third and it's just not always good enough. I agree with the Portugal as well. I thought it's been a bit of a Ronaldo carry job to an extent. And also, I feel like Croatia, I feel like after, after they, they, they was in the final in 2018, everyone's expecting them to come in hot into this tournament, but their team is just is not the same as it was a few years ago. It's just got um, aging legs and it's been a bit underwhelming for them i think um turkey as well there were sort of everyone's dark horses it was all all over twitter about everyone that picked turkey as dark horses may not have watched a game of football <laughs> before but um i think they had a good enough squad to at least or to get out of the group but let alone maybe get a point or a win but they just looked completely out of the depth and so that was disappointing yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, Turkey, I think a lot of people had tipped them to be the dark horse and I think they all feel a bit silly now. Beth, you said earlier you're difficult to play, so I assume there's a few teams that might have disappointed you a bit, but do any of those top the list? Yeah, I, I do echo what like what all the lads have said and also England, obviously. Like, that is, You don't want them to be a disappointment. You don't want them to, you know... You don't, you yeah, you don't want to be disappointed by them. But I mean, I am so far, and I really hope they like they prove me wrong, and they they actually start doing like being more creative and and doing bits on the field because it, at the minute it is just it it just, they just like make you feel like oh, God like typical like just prove us wrong. Um, and a player Sterling as well. I think Sterling again. I don't want to be on the hate Sterling fan wagon, but like Sterling, I think you think when he got a goal against um, Croatia, you think it like, okay, he's got his goal now. He's, he's going to, he's going to start coming into his prime, but no, he didn't let you down. And, you know, you, I, I want him to pick that back up because when he is on the ball and he's 
scoring goals for fun. That's you know that's what we want to see from him, but we're just not seeing that yet. Yeah, no, I'm in total agreement. I think um, you know I think England have been the most disappointing for me. I think only because you know as an England fan you get sucked into this feeling of believing you're going to go all the way. There's all those talented players. You see Foden dye his hair like Paul Gascoigne. You think, well, it's really all happening and. Uh, <laughs> It's been a bit lacklustre so far, but as you say, hopefully they prove me wrong and hopefully they prove all of us wrong. And, uh, you know, hopefully it, it gets better from here. We've all predicted a win against Czech Republic on Tuesday evening, so hopefully it does go that way and hopefully it's a little bit more exciting than it has, be, has been. But um, anyway, it's been great to chat to you. I think that's sort of, you know, running to the end of our time here, but it's, you know, I could talk about England all day, but we are time bound. But, you know, I just want to thank you all for joining us. You've all been great. And uh, yeah, it's really enjoyable. Hope you guys liked it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, no, it was really good. Thank you.